We've learned that there are about 3,500 species of plants in New England, and that our region is really pretty diverse in plants, with lots of cool habitats in which they can grow. Now let's dig a little deeper into the composition of our flora. We hear a lot about non-native and invasive species these days, and we'll explore that concept in more detail a little later on. For now, it's important to point out that the majority, 69% of New England's plant species are native. About one-fifth, though, of our native species are considered rare. That is, they're listed as endangered, threatened, special concern, or even historic in one or more New England state. But what do we mean by native anyway? To assess whether a plant is native to a region, we have to use several different measures. First off, we ask, has a given plant been here a very long time? In excess of 300 years or more when the commerce between our region and foreign lands really began in earnest? So we note down the dates when the first collections of particular plant species began in New England. We can actually go very far back into deep time to understand what species were here long before even the first Native Americans settled here. We do this by taking pollen cores. Pollen grains of many plant species have a hard shell that's resistant to decay. Thus, they're easily preserved in the fossil record. To take a core, we place a metal cylinder deep into the soil particularly into peat or lake bed layers of soils where pollen grains are preserved in an oxygen-free environment and thus don't degrade. When we pull the core out, we see different layers of sediment with the most recently deposited layers on top and the older layers farther down in the core. The core on the right shows contrasting colors that correspond to the different environments that predominated going back thousands of years in time. We can independently determine the age of each layer through a process called carbon dating. We then extract the microscopic pollen grains that lie within each layer. The slide on the left shows a sample of pollen grains taken from a single layer in a soil core. The size, shape, texture, and color of pollen grains vary among plant species, and palynologists, those are the scientists who study pollen, can tell which pollen types correspond to which species, or at least which genus of plants that might have been growing on the landscape many years ago. On the right, you'll see a graph that plots the abundances of pollen grains that are present in each layer of core, which corresponds to a period of time on the vertical axis. Wow! We can go back nearly 14,000 years in time to a period in which the glaciers that once scoured New England were receding. A little after 14,000 years ago, look at the plot in blue on the lower left, spruce, which is a very cold tolerant tree species, was the dominant tree, comprising about 80% of all pollen in the core. 1,000 years later, ash trees were beginning to gain a foothold, and by 11,000 years ago, elm was taking its place on the stage. Oak species were really beginning to take off around 9,000 years ago, and they still hold sway today. Herbaceous species like grasses and ragweed picked up in numbers after about 7,000 years ago, when New England's climate warmed unusually. Incidentally, did you know that ragweed, the cause of hay fever, is native? This analysis enables us both to detect which species and genera have been here for a very long time and to appreciate the major changes that have occurred in our flora over thousands of years. 400 or more years ago, colonialists from Europe began to move into northeastern North America. Vikings were in northeastern Canada even earlier. They brought with them the best of the best crops and, yes, weeds from Europe into the new continent. But they also made note of the plants that were already here. Some of the specimens that they collected are still in museums for plants that we call herbaria. Herbarium collections, such as the one on the lower right, store detailed records of plants, many of which are pressed into papers that allow them to be preserved and studied generations on. 
Now, as colonialists settled the land, they often preserved mature trees that could mark the corners or boundaries of particular parcels, and they recorded these very carefully. These are called witness trees. These also give us a good profile of the dominant trees that existed several centuries ago. And some of these witness trees still exist today, like this huge old sugar maple along a stone wall on my own property in Amherst, Massachusetts. Botanists have been working in New England for many, many years, painstakingly documenting the plants that they find on their forays into interesting habitats. Even 100 years later, their collections and photographs enable us to track how habitats and plants have changed over time. On the left, an old photograph shows one of our most eminent botanists, Merritt Lyndon Fernald, and his colleagues resting after an arduous day in the field. On the right, we see a photo in the upper right that they took of a high elevation site in 1906. In 2006, contemporary botanists were able to revisit this site and to see that more trees have taken over, but that otherwise this remote place has not changed dramatically in the past century. We also note the habitat uses of particular plants. Native plants often specialize on particular types of intact habitats and show special adaptations that allow them to survive in the environmental conditions of those habitats. Other plants that are non-native tend to be able to inhabit a broad range of habitats and they are planted in many different garden situations. They adapt quickly. This Japanese knotweed appears able to sprout right through pavement. Next, we look at the geographical distribution of plants. Do they occupy a continuous range, or does their distribution look kind of choppy, indicating that people might have introduced them beyond their natural range? An example of an introduced plant is umbrella tree, Magnolia tripetala. It's a plant with big white flowers and huge leaves, so it's attractive to gardeners everywhere. On the map to the right, you'll see its distribution in North America. The heart of its natural range is in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia, West Virginia, North Carolina, and Kentucky, where the states are denoted in green. The states with red, orange, or yellow colors are places where it's imperiled in the wild probably reaching the northern or southern edges of its climatic tolerance range. Note that it's rare in Ohio and Pennsylvania at the northern edge of its range. In New York, farther north though, we see a pink color indicating that it's introduced there, above the natural northern edge of its range. It has also been introduced into the gardens of Massachusetts and Connecticut. Check out Go Botany for a close-up of its status. And from those gardens here, it has escaped, and in certain places, actually proliferated in the wild. Now, dispersal mode is another important factor, feature of plants to consider in understanding whether they are native or non-native. Gardeners can be a huge force in introducing new species to any region, but so can hikers or any one of us. Many non-native species produce seeds or fruits that are really good at hitchhiking onto animals, into highway fill, or onto us directly. Other types of fruits or seeds may be very attractive to birds and mammals that can carry them for long distances and then deposit them elsewhere. When you visit an area, check your clothing for some of those clever little seeds. They may be using you to get someplace else. Finally, many native plant species are members of a tight-knit community, not just of plants, but also of pollinators, herbivores, and animals that use them for habitat and nesting sites. That's why native plants tend to be a good choice for creating a garden that provides many useful ecological services in addition to being beautiful to look at. Professor Doug Tallamy of Delaware State University has made an extensive study of the ways in which native plants foster and support biodiversity, especially insect diversity. 
he contrasts these with the much lower diversity of organisms that are associated with non-native plants. And some non-native plants can be actively harmful to certain organisms. For example, the invasive vine, black swallowwort, Sinancum louisii, which is a relative of milkweed, attracts monarch butterflies to lay their eggs on it, even in preference to their usual native milkweed host plants. However, their larvae, or caterpillars, cannot feed and develop to maturity on this species. Given the significant declines we're now seeing among large groups of important pollinators, such as bees and butterflies, doesn't it make sense to plant the plant species with which they have co-evolved, rather than plants that don't give them what they need, or, in some cases, actually harm them? Think about it. If you and your neighbors planted just one native plant today, we'd have a major restoration program for birds, butterflies, and all of the other species that have co-evolved with that plant. Our gardens become a haven, not just for us, but for life in general.